Good afternoon, everyone. I have a question for you. My question is, is the Bible true? Well, you might think, well, of course it is. That's an easy answer. Wrong audience to be asking that question. But really, is the Bible true? This is a picture of the Gutenberg Bible. It's the first printed Bible. The first editions came out in the 1450s over 560 years ago. Let me repeat my opening question. Is the Bible true? There was a survey that was done a couple of years ago by Arizona Christian University. And they asked a question that I think really has a profound effect on what is somebody's actual worldview. And the question was, about whether the Bible is the Word of God. They did this survey in the United States, and about 41% of the people, so this would be about four out of 10 Americans, said, yes, the Bible is true. That's only four out of 10 Americans. You walk around any city, it's going to be sometimes more, sometimes less, but only four out of 10 Americans. Pew Research did a similar study. They did theirs in Europe, and they found that only two out of 10 Europeans believe that the Bible is the Word of God. So what's interesting about this is in that same survey, they also had people who said that they believe in God, but yet they don't believe the Bible is the Word of God. So a typical quote from somebody of this belief is, well, yes, I believe in God, but the Bible was written by men, and it's full of historical inaccuracies. So what do you say? Is the Bible true? Is the Bible the Word of God? What about Bible stories? Ah, well, what, are, what about those stories? Are they accurate? Are they historically accurate? Do they actually have a foundation in truism from an historical perspective? Or are they just, well, are they just stories? Are they just myths made up in the minds of men? Now, my purpose today is not to convince you that the entirety of the Bible is true. I have a sermon ad. I'm going to keep it brief. It's not even to convince you that the Bible is the Word of God. However, what I am going to do is take one story, just one story, from the Bible and show you how that story was believed to be a Bible story and therefore a Bible myth, but then over time was proven to be true. So my purpose today is to encourage you to remember Hezekiah's tunnel. And for those of you that like titles, that's the title, is Remember Hezekiah's Tunnel. I'd like to take you back in time, 2,700 years, to the time of King Hezekiah of Judah. King Hezekiah was a reformer, and he purified the religious practices of Judah during his reign. Yet, he inherited a problem on the world scene. That problem was Assyria. His father had already been paying tribute to Assyria, and so it was expected that it would continue on with Hezekiah. And Assyria was the world superpower of the day. They were the largest empire in the world to that date. They ruled with an iron fist. And Assyria had already captured, by the time of Hezekiah, had captured and taken into captivity the northern ten tribes. So King Hezekiah anticipated that by the time of King Sennacherib of Assyria, that they would be attacked, that Jerusalem would be attacked. Now, it's interesting, we talk about weapons and weaponry in this day and age, and we typically think of offensive weapons. But actually, the super weapon of that age was a wall. Now, you might think, well, how could a wall be a weapon? Well, if you had a wall and you had it high enough and fortified enough, you became a less desirable target to a big marauding army like Assyria, who would see and recognize really the only offense against the defense of a wall was to do a siege. Well, sieges take time. You have to stop a moving, advancing army to surround a city and wait for them to run out of food and water. That takes time. So 
typically they would just pass by a fortified city, unless it's somewhere like Jerusalem, where they're trying to put it under their thumb. And so what the Assyrians did was they wanted to go after Jerusalem, and Hezekiah realized, I need to fortify my wall, which he did during his reign, and I also need to secure my food and water. Now, one of the problems that Hezekiah had was that the main source of water for Jerusalem was the Gihon Spring. Now, the Gihon Spring at one time was outside the city walls. So they fortified and built around the Gihon Spring to bring it inside the city walls. But they still had a problem. The Gihon Spring, any of the excess of the Gihon Spring actually flowed out into the Kidron Valley. This is a picture of the Kidron Valley from when we were in Jerusalem a, a few years ago. It's very dry, arid. But at that time, it was actually watered by the Gihon Spring. So all this extra water in times of peace was a good thing because they actually could produce crops in the Kidron Valley. They could, it was a good thing. However, in a time of siege, that water would go to the enemy. And so this is talked about, it's discussed in the Bible. And you read about that in the book of 2 Chronicles. If you turn with me to the book of 2 Chronicles, chapter 32, we're going to start in verses 2 through 4. The book of 2 Chronicles, chapter 32, and verses 2 through 4. In verse 2, And when Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib had come, and that his purpose was to make war with Jerusalem, he consulted with his leaders and commanders to stop the waters from the springs, which were outside the city, and they helped him. Thus many people gathered together who stopped all the springs and the brook that ran through the land, saying, Why should the kings of Assyria come and find much water? Now turn with me later in the chapter, again, Second Chronicles chapter 30, 32 and verse 30, and it says, This same Hezekiah also stopped the water outlet from Upper Gihon and brought the water by tunnel to the west side of the city of David. Hezekiah prospered in all his works. And that's the Bible story of Hezekiah's tunnel. It's also mentioned, turn with me to the book of 2 Kings, chapter 20. 2 Kings, chapter 20, verse 20. Now the rest of the acts of Hezekiah, all his might, and how he made a pool and a tunnel and brought water into the city. Are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? So Hezekiah's plan, which he executed, was to dig a tunnel. Now that tunnel had to go through solid bedrock, and it would go from the Gihon Spring to the Pool of Siloam on the west side of the city of David. And as King Hezekiah anticipated, Sennacherib did eventually send his army of almost 200,000 men to lay siege to Jerusalem. The aftermath of that battle is one of the great mysteries of history, but we know the answer to what happened in that, in that battle. The, the undefeated Assyrian army at that time laid siege to Jerusalem, but then was decimated outside the walls of the city on the first night of Passover, just as Isaiah had prophesied. The kingdom of, the kingdom of Judah was miraculously saved by God from the Assyrian onslaught. So that's the end of the story of Hezekiah's tunnel in the Bible. That's the last we hear of Hezekiah's tunnel. Are those two references in 2 Chronicles and 2 Kings? We do hear about the Pool of Siloam in the New Testament, but there's no further mention of Hezekiah's tunnel. And so from a biblical pers perspective, that's the end of the story. And the interesting part is, from an historical perspective, when Rome laid siege to Jerusalem and decimated Jerusalem in 70 AD, they buried much of the city, including Hezekiah's tunnel, never to be seen again from 70 AD forward. And so in the ensuing centuries, the only record of there ever being a tunnel are those two brief mentions in 2 Chronicles and 2 Kings about Hezekiah's tunnel. And so biblical scholars scoffed at it. They doubted it. They said, well, 
It's just a Bible story. There's no physical evidence that there was actually a tunnel cut through the bedrock. They didn't even have the, the tools or technology or the, or the engineering skills to do something like it. It's just a Bible story. It's just a Bible story. It's just a myth. And it was dismissed. Well, for a period of time it was. And then in the 1800s, in 1838, Hezekiah's tunnel was rediscovered by Edward Robinson. And then later in 1867, a gentleman, uh, Sir Charles Warren, discovered a vertical shaft leading into the tunnel, which would have provided access to the tunnel and its water during a time of siege. The tunnel was eventually excavated, and it's now accessible to visitors to Jerusalem today. You and I can go to Jerusalem and actually go to Hezekiah's tunnel and walk through it, walk the full length of it. My wife and I, Brandon, Christine, um, Blake, and Ashley McLarensbury, were in Jerusalem a few years ago, and we had that opportunity. We actually walked the full length of Hezekiah's tunnel. And it's an amazing feat of ancient engineering. It's about 533 meters long, or almost the distance of six football fields, cut entirely through solid rock. And the elevation drop of it is only one foot in total along that full length. It's a 0 0.06 gradient over that, over that area of almost 600 yards. The height of the tunnel varies anywhere from about 12 feet down to only about five feet in some places. And it's typically just wide enough for maybe one person to pass through. And if you look closely, you can see the chisel marks on the wall. Remember, this was cut entirely by hand tools. The tunnel goes all the way from the Gihon Spring on the east side of the city to the Pool of Siloam on the west side of the city. Yet the interesting thing is even after the discovery of Hezekiah's tunnel, there were still doubters. There were still people that said, oh, well, you, you, yeah, you found a tunnel, but it's not Hezekiah's tunnel. This is a tunnel that was done much later. It's too technologically advanced to have been done in 700 BC. It couldn't have been done way back then. They didn't have the tools, the technology, the engineering. They couldn't have done it. And so there were people who scoffed at it. And then there was one more discovery that was found in the 1880s. Uh, in, in 1880, they found something that's called the Siloam inscription. It's found about halfway down the tunnel. And we, this is my picture of it in the tunnel using a, a bright light to... Um, and by the way, the actual inscription has been removed and it's been moved to the, to the Istanbul... Um, Istanbul Archaeology Museum, this is a picture of it there, that's the actual inscription that they found at the halfway point in the tunnel. This is a picture of Brandon and Christine right next to the, right next to the inscription point. Now, why was that inscription important? For several reasons. First of all, because it told about what the tunnel construction was about, but it also dates the tunnel because of the specific use of the Paleo-Hebrew letters, wording, phrases that were being used. So I'm going to read to you what the Siloam inscription says. It also reveals something amazing about the tunnel construction. And this is the story of the tunnel with the axes. While the axes were against each other, and while three cubits were left, the voice of a man called to his counterpart. And on the day of the tunnel being finished, the stonecutters struck each man toward his counterpart, axe against axe, and water flowed from the source of the pool for 1,200 cubits, and 100 cubits was the height of the rock over the head of the stonecutters. End quote. So did you catch that? They didn't start at one end and finish it, start at point A and end at point B. They started at both ends, and they met in the middle, exactly where they needed to meet. So not only was Hezekiah's tunnel built at that time, it was built in an even more amazing 
way than they thought. And by the, again, when they go back to the inscription and they look at the, the Paleo-Hebrew alphabet at the time and the writing symbols, they were able to date this inscription that was placed in the tunnel to the seventh century BC, the time of Hezekiah. So not only is Hezekiah's tunnel true and authentic, it's considered to be one of antiquity's greatest civil engineering accomplishments. Is the Bible true? Remember the story of Hezekiah's tunnel, clearly recorded in the Bible, yet for centuries it was questioned and assumed to be a myth. It's just one of many such Bible stories that have been rediscovered and proven by modern archaeology. Is the Bible true? Yes, the Bible is true. And as one more piece of that truth, please remember Hezekiah's tunnel.